Okay, well, we'll get started here. Um, I want to welcome everybody. I'm John Ware, Executive Director at the Center for the Environment here at Catawba College. Tonight's program will examine the very diverse wildlife refuges we are so fortunate to have here in North Carolina. We will also learn about the work of the National Wildlife Refuge Association and its role in supporting and protecting our national wildlife refuge system. Our speakers tonight are career U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service veterans and both now currently make up part of the leadership team for this association. Jeff Haskett is president and Mike Bryant is regional representative for North Carolina and South Carolina. Over the course of the last year, I've enjoyed working with these two individuals as we look at our ways, our center, uh, the Department of Environment and Sustainability, the Department of Biology and Catawba College as a whole can partner with their organization in ways that can assist in each other's efforts. One exciting aspect of this partnership hopes to open up ways for our faculty and students to engage in active research and management activities on these refuges in North Carolina, as well as across the nation. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff and to Mike. Welcome. Thank you, John. Appreciate that very much. So I also wanna int introduce Eden Taylor, who is actually our technology person to make sure this all works really well tonight. So what the plan is, I'm gonna take about five or 10 minutes to talk about what the National Life Refuge Association is about, both nationally, mostly nationally, what we're about. And then Mike Bryan, who's our representative in both North and South Carolina, will go ahead and talk about refuges in North Carolina, which I think is probably the main reason most people have, have tuned in here. I did wanna though, take the opportunity to thank John. He mentioned we've got a great working partnership going on over the last year. And the reason that even happened is, is that um, I know that Fred and Alice Stanbeck live in your community and um, they are probably our major supporter for the work the Refuge Association does. And they direct the, when they support us, their um, funds be go to work for North Carolina and Florida specifically. And we wouldn't even have a North Carolina program without them. So I wanna thank them specifically. I also want to mention the only reason I, I know Dr. Weir is because of them. I've only had the opportunity to meet them once a number of years ago, and they, they told me I needed to go meet with Dr. John Weir at Catawba College. And it took us a while to hook up, it took us a couple of years till we finally did. But um, a year ago, right before COVID, back when we could actually meet with people and it wasn't all virtual like this, I went out to the college and and met with some of the faculty there and with students and had just a great session talking about the Refuge Association and the difference between a nonprofit and what refuges are about. So um, we've established, I think, a great relationship and I think you'll see that as we go through these slides. So Eden, if you would, let's go start um, my part of the show and I'll talk about what the National Wildlife Refuge Association is about. And I'm going to start with a video. We have a short two-minute video. I think does a great job talking about it. So we'll do that first. From their earliest years, National Wildlife Refuges have played a major role in resource conservation in the United States. More than a century since its creation, the National Wildlife Refuge System has grown to become the world's most extensive network of public lands and waters dedicated to the conservation of wildlife. Today, the mission of the National Wildlife Refuge System is to administer a national network of lands and waters for the conservation, management, and where appropriate, restoration of the fish, wildlife, and plant resources in their habitats for the benefit of present and future generations. There is at least one National Wildlife Refuge in every state and territory and within hours drive of most major metropolitan areas. National Wildlife Refuges provide important habitat for more than 700 species of birds, 220 species of mammals, 250 reptile and amphibian species, and more than a thousand species of fish. More than 380 threatened or endangered plant species or animals are protected on wildlife refuges. One organization is dedicated to protecting this network of public lands and waters, the National Wildlife Refuge Association. The mission of the National Wildlife Refuge Association is to conserve America's wildlife heritage for future generations through strategic programs that protect and enhance the National Wildlife Refuge system and the landscapes beyond its boundaries. 
the Refuge Association is the leading defender of America's most important program for protecting wildlife habitat, the National Wildlife Refuge System. Our staff in Washington, D.C. and around the country monitors legislation, policy, and other activities that affect refuges. From ensuring that the refuge system has sufficient funding to battling legislation that could undermine a refuge's integrity, the Refuge Association works to safeguard these natural treasures and the wild creatures that depend on them. Okay, so I think that's a pretty good two minute introduction to what we're about. So one of the things when I talk to, to John's students last year, there, there's always, whenever I talk to a group, there's always some confusion about the difference between national parks and refuges. And parks were, are land set aside by an act of Congress, um, 85 million acres in their system, 62 parks, 422 units, and they're managed for historical, cultural, and natural preservation and recreation. Refuges are a completely different kind of creation. Um, their land and water set aside by executive orders, act of Congresses, Secretary of the Interior, also the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And the total of the National Wildlife Refuge System is 855 million acres. That's 586 refuges. There's 100 million acre land acres, 80 million acres of those in Alaska, uh, 20 million in the lower 48, and 750 million acres of, of ocean monuments. Uh, refuge systems managed for wildlife conservation, habitat, possible introduction of native fauna and flora, recreation as well, but subject to conservation. 25% of our refuges are closed for research and other reasons. So another difference between the park system and parks and the National Wildlife Refuge System is that refuges are buried within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which isn't a bad thing, but it makes it a little difficult for people to recognize refuges sometimes. When you hear about a park, it's part of the park system. There's just no kind of question. Refuges are part of the, of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So the Refuge Association is a nonprofit established to advocate for the wildlife refuge system. Um, we advocate, we support, we're an independent public 501c3. Our exclusive focus is on protecting the National Wildlife Refuge System. Um, we want to undertake programs that contribute to the system's conservation impact. Our mission is that we're the leading independent voice advocating on behalf of the National Wildlife Refuge System. We protect, promote, and enhance America's wildlife heritage through, just, through strategic programs that serve the system of wildlife beyond its boundaries. And our vision is to inspire nationwide support for the National Wildlife Refuge System, its wildlife and habitats. Our primary role is an advocacy one. We protect. We, our expert staff closely monitors legislation, policy, other activities that impact refuges and respond to banished threats and, and assure strength of the refuge system. We promote social justice. We have an urban program. We work with refuge friends across the country and we enhance through advocating for refuge funding in the halls of Congress and with the administration. And I'll tell you, it's, it's sometimes difficult. Different administrations change. They have different ideas. Sometimes we're in the middle of actually litigating as the Fish and Wildlife Service on different activities. We won't spend much time talking about that tonight, but that's part of our advocacy role. Friends groups I mentioned, we have 200 some friends groups across the country where a refuge has a group of people that have, have started their own nonprofit to go ahead and, and support and protect as well. And although we are not officially part of those, those refuge friends groups, we are probably the group that they turn to the most in terms of when they, when they want to band together to advocate for something, when specific needs for refuge, that kind of thing. So we work super closely with friends groups. I mentioned we have an urban program. Right now that's in Southern California, but we're looking to expand that out to Florida. Um, we're looking at other parts of the country. So we work closely with nonprofits in Los Angeles, um, creating schoolyard habitats, talking about refuges, habitat restoration, um, and that's an area we want to do more of. Maybe in North Carolina, um, we have a long ways to go on that, but we're, we're definitely putting more emphasis on that part of our program as well. Conservation science, we do that in Florida, Pacific Northwest and Puerto Rico. Um, in Florida, we do Everglades protection. We're working with ranchers there for conservation easements to allow best practices to enhance water quality, limit development, 
It's mostly easements we're doing there. In the Pacific Northwest, we're working with the Fish and Wildlife Service to collect critical scientific data for the best management practices, mostly about eradication of invasive species. And in Puerto Rico, we're involved with the Fish and Wildlife Service in a major Caribbean sea turtle habit restoration and monitoring project. So I've kind of given you a, a quick, quick, you know, glimpse of what the National Life Refuge Association is about, but we do have a major program in North Carolina, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike Bryant to talk about the refuges in North Carolina. And like I said, the last half an hour, our plan is to be able to have conversation and questions with you all if you have specific questions after either one of our presentations. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Let's take a virtual 20-minute, 600-mile trip from Murphy, North Carolina to Manio. Stopping along the way, we'll find the 11 National Wildlife Refuges in North Carolina. We've got a lot of miles to cover and over 442,000 acres of National Wildlife Refuge lands in North Carolina to discover. About 100 miles west of Salisbury, North Carolina is Mountain Bogs National Wildlife Refuge. It's the furthest west and the newest National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. It was established in 2015. Currently, it's at 7,227 acres, but only 24 of those acres are owned. The rest are in conservation easements. The vision for this refuge over time with partners is to grow it to over 23,000 acres in 11 western counties to conserve southern Appalachian mountain bogs. These are rare, fragile habitats, and they're biologically diverse with unique species like the bog turtle, the smallest turtle found in the U.S. It's only four and a half inches long. And mountain sweet pitcher plant, a beautiful insectivorous plant. Management includes invasive species control, wetland and stream restoration, and forest canopy thinning. There's no public use at this time because the vast majority of these lands are private lands. Now we travel 153 miles to PD National Wildlife Refuge which is 56 miles south-southeast of Salisbury, and it was established in 1963. It's 8,500 acres in size, and its purpose is as a migratory bird sanctuary. Habitats include the bottom-line hardwood forests, farm fields, moist soil areas, and ponds. Wildlife include thousands of wintering waterfowl and nesting wood ducks, as well as turkey and a, and a host of other wildlife. The refuge has an example of one of the South's rarest pine ecosystems, the wet Piedmont longleaf pine forest. Management includes cooperative farming for migratory birds, water management, prescribed burning in pine forests and old fields, and inventory and monitoring of habitat and wildlife. And public uses include hunting, fishing, and wildlife observation. Now we head east 230 miles to North Carolina's Northeast Coastal Plain, where we find nine National Wildlife Refuges. In the Upper Coastal Plain, we find Roanoke River National Wildlife Refuge near Windsor, North Carolina. Established in 1989 with the help of the Nature Conservancy, it is now 20,500 acres in size. This Roanoke River floodplain contains the largest intact, least disturbed bottomland hardwood forest ecosystem in the Mid-Atlantic region. The purpose of the refuge is to protect and conserve these habitats for migratory birds, such as this prothonotary warbler and the yellow crowned night heron and other wildlife, as well as providing migratory and spawning habitat for blueback herring and striped bass. They also have white tailed deer, turkey, black bear, and feral hogs on the land. It has the largest inland breeding heron rookery in North Carolina as well. Management includes forest thinning, invasive species control, and inventory and monitoring. Public uses include hunting, fishing, and wildlife observation, and it's a great place to kayak. Now we head 50 miles east onto the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula in the lower coastal plain where we find four national wildlife refuges. The two largest and the two oldest refuges are here in North Carolina. The two largest are the 110,000 acre Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, established in 1990 with help from the Conservation Fund and the 158,000 acre Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge established in 1984 with the help of the Nature Conservancy. The two oldest refuges are the 50,000 acre Madame Mesquite National Wildlife Refuge established in 1934 
and the 16,000 acre Swan Quarter National Wildlife Refuge established in 1932. Let's start at Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. Pocosins are swamps on a hill, a wetland bog with sandy peat soils and woody shrubs throughout. Hill is a relative term when the highest ground is only 30 feet above sea level. It's a broad, gently sloping dome of peat that drops in elevation only one inch per mile. Groundwater from rain saturates these organic soils. The peat in the soil acts like a sponge. Except during seasonal dry spells and prolonged droughts when this soil dries and oxidizes slowly and can catch fire and burn. Prior to being a refuge, much of the land was ditched and drained. The purpose is to conserve these unique coastal wetlands through restoration of the altered hydrology, which improves and protects habitat. The management focuses on water, installing water control structures in the ditches that exist through the refuge to maintain the water take. Also, there's management for wildfire and inventory and monitoring of things like tundra swan and other uh, select species. There's 12,350 acre unit called the Pungo unit within the Pocosa Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. And it is a former National Wildlife Refuge that was established in 1963 as a migratory bird refuge. It's managed for wintering waterfowl. And there are more than 100,000 snow geese, tundra swan, and ducks that rest and feed on Pungo Lake in the winter and the adjacent farm fields in moist soil and pounds. Public uses include deer hunting, fishing, and wildlife observation. And on this refuge, black bear are easily seen because there is a very dense population of black bear on, on the refuge. Now we head 20 miles east to Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. It's on its own sub-peninsula bounded by the Alligator River and Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds. It only averaged three feet above sea level. It has many diverse habitat types, high and low pocosins, as well as bogs, marshes, ponds, creeks, Atlantic white cedar forests, cypress gum swamps, farm fields, moist soil impoundments, to name a few. The refuge surrounds 46,000 acre Department of Defense bombing range, which is mostly similar to refuge habitat, except for two 200, uh, 2,500 acre impact areas. They don't blow up things. They just practice dropping dummy bombs and shooting targets. There's still a lot of great habitat within the bombing range. The purpose of the refuge is to protect, preserve, and restore the unique habitat types and wildlife associated with them. Water management and fire management are the primary tools. The refuge and bombing range have become a large sea level rise adaptive management area where with partners, a variety of actions have been taken to see what worked best to slow the rate of change brought on by sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. Inventory and monitoring work that are done to determine if the actions are working, such as this man looking at a R set station, which measures how much accretion or erosion occurs in the marshes near the sounds. Wildlife that benefit include American alligators, black bear, red wolves, which breed and have pups there, waterfowl, such as the pintail flock here, getting up off one of the managed and pounded areas, and a wide variety of migratory birds in the forests, like the indigo bunny. In 1987, red wolves were reintroduced into, into the wild on this refuge. It's a long story for another day. Public uses include hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, and canoeing and kayaking. These tours you see in the picture are being conducted by a college intern who is working at the refuge in the summer when uh, there's a lot of visitation and the tours are being given by the intern who works for the friends group that supports this refuge. Now let's head southwest about 60 miles to Madame Mesquite and Swan Quarter National Wildlife Refuges. Madame Mesquite's centerpiece is the 400,000 acre shallow Lake Madame Mesquite, North Carolina's largest natural lake. The purpose of this refuge is as an inviolate sanctuary for migratory birds, 
with emphasis on wintering waterfowl and as a refuge and breeding ground for birds and wild animals. Habitats surrounding the lake include marsh, forest, cropland, and grassland. The refuge hosts greater than 200,000 wintering waterfowl that come from the Atlantic Flyway. In this flyway, 20 to 30% of the green winged teal, 40 to 80% of the northern pintails, and 25 to 35% of tundra swan winter on and around this refuge, along with more than 20 species of other waterfowl, as well as wading birds, shorebirds, and other wetland species such as osprey. Management includes water level and water quality monitoring and wildlife and aquatic plant inventory and monitoring. And the public uses include hunting, such as these duck hunters, and fishing and wildlife observation. A few miles south and west of Mather Mesquite, we find Swan Quarter National Wildlife Refuge. Its purpose is to conserve wetland habitat types for the benefit of migratory birds, threatened and endangered species, and waterfowl. 8,000 of the acres, which are half of the acreage of the whole refuge, is a national wilderness area. 27,000 acres of the waters of the Pamlico Sound adjacent to the refuge have a presidential proclamation over them where no waterfowl hunting is allowed. It's a resting and feeding area for waterfowl. Habitats including brackish marsh, mixed pine hardwood forest, and high Pocosin. Wildlife include species like the American black duck and canvasback ducks and other swamp, marsh, and open water wildlife species. Management includes inventory, monitoring, and protection of wilderness character, and surveying migratory birds and threatened and endangered species. And public uses include waterfowl hunting, fishing on the Bell Island Pier. Now let's go 27 miles south across the Pamlico Sound to find Cedar Island National Wildlife Refuge. It was established in 1964. It's 14,494 acres or just five miles from the Atlantic Ocean. 11,000 acres are irregularly flooded brackish marsh and 3,500 acres are woodland habitat, including a longleaf pine ridge and pond pine and live oak stands. It's a migratory bird refuge. There are thousands of waterfowl, wintering waterfowl, which use the refuge and adjacent waters and its sandy shore support colonial water birds and the marsh harbors the threatened black rail. It's a small sparrow-sized secretive marsh bird, slate gray in color with red eyes. Cedar Island National Wildlife Refuge is one of the last places they're found in North Carolina. Management includes protection, and that often means law enforcement here, and inventory and monitoring and prescribed burning. And the public uses there include hunting and wildlife observation. Now we have to fly north 104 miles to the northeast corner of North Carolina to Mackey Island National Wildlife Refuge on Knott's Island. It was established in 1960. It's 8,651 acres of which 882 are in Virginia. There's a proclamation boundary on 4,600 acres of the refuge and 1,100 acres in the Kerfuck Sound, which close these areas to the waterfowl hunting. The purpose of the refuge is to provide habitat for migratory waterfowl. Habitats include tidal freshwater marshes, moist soils, forests, croplands, and grasslands. The wildlife you find there include wintering waterfowl and migrating and nesting migratory birds. The marsh holds a significant number of king rail. And this was uh, found out over time with research and then with additional research they kept finding more and more. And so it is a, a very important area for this uh, species, which is uh, reduced in its population over the years. Management at the refuge includes water management, prescribed burns, and native plant restoration for pollinators. And the public uses include deer hunting, birding, and fishing. Now we go three miles by boat across the Currituck Sound to Currituck National Wildlife Refuge. It was established in 1984. Seven, it's 7,630 acres in size, and its purpose is to protect and preserve this coastal barrier <laughs> ecosystem for migratory birds, wildlife, fish, and plants that depend on it. Habitats include beach dunes, 
maritime forests, and brackish marsh. Wildlife that you find there are wintering waterfowl, and there's a wading bird rookery on Monkey Island, which is an island in Currituck Sound. Management includes things like putting up exclusion fences to protect uh, sensitive native plant areas, prescribed burns in the marshes, invasive species management, such as feral hog removal. The public uses include deer hunting and waterfowl hunting and wildlife observation. Now on the last leg of our tour, we drive 58 miles south to Pea Island National Wildlife Refuge. It was established in 1938 by executive order to provide nesting, resting, and wintering habitat for migratory birds and other wildlife. It's 5,834 acres of refuge lands and 25,700 acres of adjacent proclamation waters on the Pamlico Sound. The refuge is the first 13 miles of Hatteras Island, starting at Oregon Inlet. It's a narrow barrier island with North Carolina Highway 12 through it. Habitats include ocean beach, dune, flat overwash areas, brackish ponds, high and low marsh, and three managed shallow impoundments. Wildlife includes over 350 species of migratory birds, which have been identified on Pea Island over the years, migratory uh, sea turtles, and other wildlife. Management includes adjusting water levels on impoundments, prescribed burning in the marsh, inventory and monitoring of thousands of wintering waterfowl, such as redhead and red and ringneck ducks, shorebirds like the black neck stilt and other migratory birds. And there's inventory and monitoring that occurs for beach nesting birds like the least tern and the American oyster catcher and sea turtles, whose nests are protected and monitored during their nesting season public uses. Well, there are millions of people who drive through P. Allen every year, and hundreds of thousands of these are visitors to come bird watch, fish, kayak, beach comb, and, and just take in this very unique and special place. There are hidden treasures in these 11 National Wildlife Refuges. We started this quick journey in North Carolina's Southern Appalachian Mountains at 4,000 feet above sea level with the smallest turtle in North America, the bog turtle, at Mountain Bogs National Wildlife Refuge, and finished the trip on the Outer Banks of North Carolina at sea level with the loggerhead sea turtle on the beach at Pea Island National Wildlife Refuge. There's so much more for you to discover if you seek out these special places. The National Wildlife Refuge System and the National Wildlife Refuge Association want you to get to know and love these special wild places. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. So that's perfect, 728. We say we get through our first part of the presentations in less than 30 minutes. Look like we were able to do that because we want to be able to hear from you all. I introduced Eden Taylor at the beginning. It, what Eden's going to do is keep people muted um, unless you raise your hand, there's also a way to go ahead and do a, a check there that you want to ask a question, then she will unmute you. Um, or I see some people already taking advantage of, of the chat. You have the ability to go ahead and ask a question on chat too, so we can get to you that way as well. So I'm going to go now and um, I'm assuming that Eden can actually see you. Well, I can't actually see everybody. So Eden, maybe you should make, oh good, that's better. So questions or comments? It can be either, you know, on our national programs or specific North Carolina, whatever you all want to talk about, we're here to do. I have a question. Okay. Hi, I'm Taylor Marshall. I'm a senior here at Catawba College. Hi, Taylor. Um, hi. I was wondering, um, how do I word this? Is there like a minimum um, acreage of land in which someone can practice conservation on their land? Like, do you guys do any kind of consulting for individuals instead of, I don't know, uh, on a larger scale that you guys have shown us so far? 
So we can, so that's really not what we do, but, but I mean, certainly we have the people that have the ability to do that. We would certainly be willing to, if someone has a question about, they have a piece of property and, you know, a specific acreage, you know, we can connect them with the right people at the Fish and Wildlife Service very easily. Um, mm -hmm. The refuges themselves are all kinds of different sizes. You know, there are 20 million acre refuges in Alaska. And I don't know what the smallest one is, but it's not very big. So there's very small um, refuges across the country as well. Um, you know, there's both easement refuges and fee acquisition refuges, where sometimes people own the, the, the fee and still make it available for conservation uses. So it's, it's kind of limitless on the kinds of things you can do for conservation on different sizes of land. Mike, you anything to add to that? Yeah, I think you're right. You know, we don't do that kind of consultant, but work with it. There, there are other offices of the Fish and Wildlife Service that, that do more private landowner work. And they, there is a private lands program within the Fish and Wildlife Service. It just doesn't come out of it comes out of a different different division of the of the Fish and Wildlife Service. There's an office in Raleigh that that uh, manages those people that involve themselves in private lands work. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So I see that um, someone asked, "Do you need a permit to get into these areas? Are there hiking trails?" I don't know if there's more to that question or not. So. It just depends. I mean, the, the refuge system is huge. Like we said, there's 850 million acres in it. And there's there's places called inviolate sanctuaries as part of the refuge system where you really can't get in there because of endangered species or some other habitat reasons. Um, a lot of refuges are just pretty much open, you know, for different uses. You know, they're, they're open for hunting, for fishing, for wildlife photography, um, you know, wildlife observation. It's just kind of um, specific things will take a permit. Like if someone wants to come film on a refuge, they need a permit from the, the refuge manager there. So it just kind of depends. Yeah, and, and in North Carolina, the only refuge that right now doesn't have, uh, it's not open to the public, although people could contact uh, the, the appropriate office and in, in, in working with the private lender or maybe get access. But the, all the other, the other 10 refuges, uh, portions of all of them are open to the public at, at no cost. Now, if you are going to be involved in a hunting program, many of those are by permit and there's a small fee because they don't want too many hunters out there for safety reasons, also for just uh, you know, wildlife conservation reasons. But yeah, the, they're, these refuges, like, like Pea Island, there's a highway right through it. And literally millions of people drive through it every year and literally hundreds of thousands stop along the way and just get out and explore it and check it out from ocean to sound. And there is a, there's a small visitor center there and there's a parking lot so people can get out and park. They can go in the visitor center and after COVID <laughs> and check things out. And then there's some trails. Most of these refuges have trails as well. And, and so you, you drive into them, you find the trailhead, like I showed you the one lady in the picture. And, uh, walk in. There's a lot of wildlife photography being done by people. And, and if it's for their personal use, it, there's no permit required. But as Jeff said, if it's a, if it's a commercial venture, like a, you know, a filming for something for profit, uh, or even if it's filming for something that ends up being a nonprofit production, there would be permits required, but they're easily attained. So these places are open to the public. And right now, even during COVID, where the visitor centers aren't, the refuges, the land, the roads and the trails into them in most places are open as long as, uh, you know, weather has not prohibited because the roads are too wet. Or but we have Jamie McClellan that's from our board that's on, I see he's added to the chat. He's pointing out there's a 0.57 acre refuge in Wisconsin. So I guess our smallest one is less than an acre. Yeah. Um, there's other questions showing up here. I'm not very good at actually some of these. Right here. I see. What's that? I, I see. I see a gentleman raising his hand. He's no. He's no gentleman. We'll that's just talk. He's no gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, John. Thank you for hosting this again. We enjoyed uh, catching up with you again. Uh, Millie and I are um, have both have our shots, both shots, and we're going to. Um, and Liza, our girl, and our daughter, 45-year-old daughter, is coming back to, from Costa Rica mid-March. So we're going to say hello to her for two days. 
and then we're going to travel these refuges. Nice. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have any awesome. suggestions or resources that we might use to uh, make our efforts more efficient or effective or whatever? Yeah, for North Carolina and probably all refugees nowadays, there'll be a, a website that you can get the, the, you know, the introductory information about how to get there and what's available. And there'll be links within that to brochures and to maps and basic information about what you're likely to see. And, and there'll be contact information in there too. So you can speak either or write by, by text or writing an email to somebody within that particular refuge unit that could, that could provide you some uh, very particular information. And you can always, you can always reach out to me. I, I uh, <laughs> managed, six of these national wildlife refuges for 20 years and i'm familiar with all of them but even i have not been on mountain bogs national wildlife Refuge. mike i have a question of you um i realize i've been on all the websites and they're really great and um but i noticed that for the migratory birds the peak will have you know it will have peaked by the time we can get there in march but um it's nature, so I assume there's still lots of stuff going on. It, it, there is. It just depends on what time of the year. Just like you, you found by reading, you know, wintering waterfowl at many of these refuges uh, it peak in uh, November, December, January. So they're starting to check out and go back to breeding grounds well north of here. But then you have other birds that are migrating through, and then you have resident migratory birds that are, you know, feeding and, and uh, selecting territories and starting to think about nesting and pair, pairing up and nesting that starts to occur in March, April, and May. And so depending on the refuge, it's a, it's a matter of knowing uh, what trail or road to, to go down where you, you have a good chance of seeing things. And certainly on the coastal refuges, I, can, I, could, I could tell you, or the refuge uh, website can give you information there. If you're really into birding, you, you check uh, with like Carolina Bird Club or, and, or some of the, the, these birds uh, sites that tell you what birds are where when, because there's a bunch of birders always out there looking for birds. And when they see something special, it lights up the panel for them and they, everybody puts the word out. There were uh, snowy owls showing up here in the winter, just sitting up on, perched up on the dunes, you know, ocean in the background, snowy owls standing up on a dune and th these owls are you know almost three feet tall they're big and uh so people are coming from all over the place to see those snowy owls just standing on dunes and then soaring across the beach and hitting back on another dune but uh, there, there'll be uh shorebirds migrating through in in the early spring there's a lot of wading birds that are always around like herons and egrets and ibis and then you see hawks of, and, and other uh, raptors coursing over, over marshes and over farm fields and other units. And, and, and on Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge and, and on Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, you always have a pretty good chance of seeing black bear. There are just so many of them. And they, and they like the habitat, especially and, and the habitat they like the most is the habitat where they're most visible, and that's near farm fields and going down roads and trails. So they're, they're ambling along roads or they're getting into the farm units to forage. And, and because it's a farm, you can see a long way and see them. <clears throat> so thank, thank, you. thank you, John. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jeffrey. We're looking forward to our trip. We're going to take about a week to explore this area. And we're fortunate because Liza's taking care of the dogs. That's great. There you go. <laughs> Sounds great. Hey, I, there's a bunch of questions that are kind of piling up here in the chat, so I'm going to try and take a couple of those. So Daniel M. asked a question about how many officers and others manage all these acres. How about volunteers? So the refuge system couldn't really exist these days without volunteer help. I mean, it, it, we rely, the refuge system completely relies on volunteers. Refuge system doesn't have anywhere near the amount of people they need to have to run these refuges. A lot of refuges that used to have like 30 or 40 people in the past maybe have like 10 now. There's refuges with only one person there. For law enforcement, we have, you know, states where 
maybe there's like five or six refuges there. You only have one law enforcement person for the entire um, state refuge system there. So, I mean, one of the big things the Refuge Association is about is advocating for additional dollars for um, trying to make sure that they have operating budgets that can actually exist. Which leads to another question that someone asked about, um, and I've lost it now, but someone asked the question about, um, some, there's a question here about the budget. So I'm, I'm glad someone asked that. It's almost like they planned the questions. That's something we work on all the time. So the, the budget request for the refuge system this year is only a little over $500 million, which is the same amount that was requested like 10 years ago. Um, the number that we were trying to push with Congress, with the administration is $600 million, although we really think it's just short of a billion that you need to actually make up for inflation, those kinds of things. And the refuge system gets like a quarter of what say the park system does. And again, that's no slam against the park system. It's just refuges really does get overlooked a lot. So it's a great question. One of the major things we're doing in terms of working with the Hill and the administration. Um, is there more, anybody else raising a hand here that we should go to? I see Carolyn B is raising her hand. Okay. I assume you've unmuted her, right? Hi, I believe I'm unmuted, am I? Yep, yep. we can hear you. Okay, thank you. First, I want to thank everyone for doing this type of a presentation because um, there isn't really much of a way to raise money unless the outreach is out there and the word gets around so that people can become um, enthusiastic and, and on a larger scale. Um, but my question is the following. You had mentioned something, and I can't remember which one it was now, where there were feral hogs. I'm wondering whether uh, there are other invasive species or any comments you have on how you control that sort of a problem, like the feral hogs that are digging things up and rooting around and, and procreating at a rate that's uh, not at all helpful. <laughs> Mike, you want to take that one? You probably dealt specifically with feral hogs in your career. Yeah, well, yeah, there, there are feral hogs on Roanoke River National Wildlife Refuge, on Currituck National Wildlife Refuge, and I've heard also that they, they are on Pocosa Lakes, but apparently not too many. But what, the way they approach that is if during the hunting season for hunting deer, uh, hunters can take feral hogs it, as well. And there's also contract trappers that are used to go out and trap them out. And then the U.S. Department of Agriculture will assist sometimes to come and uh, try and control them as well. But you're right, they, they're uh, elusive, they breed a lot and produce a lot, and they, they do root up a lot of habitat. So, they're just part of the landscape, but they are invasive. Now, there are a lot of other invasive species. Uh, the ones that they focus on often are plants, like alligator weed and all the waterways, because it, it clogs up the waterways. And, and they're trying to manage water and move water, and so it starts to create a problem at every water control structure and at every pump. But there, there is focus brought to bear throughout the system because you'll find invasive species on almost every refuge in the system. And so you have to have the science to understand how to deal with it and use whatever tool is available to deal with it that's effective and doesn't have a adverse impact on the environment itself. So there's a, there's a lot of focus brought to it, but I think to Jeff's point, there aren't a lot of resources. So refuges have to be, they have to triage every issue they have and try and uh, go at it in the, the most vulnerable and difficult spots where they can have some modest amount of gain because that's about all the resources they have to do. Because it, it's a big problem and it can be very costly and it requires work year after year. It doesn't go away with one shot. Yeah, I'm trying not, we've got 15 minutes left, so I'm pretty sure we're not gonna get to everybody. So if we don't, Eden has actually gone ahead and posted on the chat that our website is refugeassociation.org and you can contact us. So if we don't get to you, have a question, we would love to get back to you. We'll call you back, talk personally with you as well. Um, as also, we'll go to some of those questions, but I also wanna make sure that Mike's got an opportunity to talk a little bit about the Refuge Association and what we're doing for Red Wolf 
in North Carolina. M Mike, is, as you mentioned, was the refuge manager for a number of these refuges for many years in North Carolina. I was very involved in the Red Wolf program. The Refuge Association is working pretty hard now with a number of partners. So um, if you might just cover that a little bit too, Mike, so that people know what we're doing, what we're doing there. Sure. You know, the, the Refuge Association is working with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in a, a formal uh, partnership agreement that helps, that has helped uh, pay for putting a person at Pocosin Lakes who does outreach and environmental education and community work specifically around the Red Wolf and the Coastal Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, which is one of the two largest refuges on which you find red wolves. And it's to, and it's, uh, other partners include Defenders of Wildlife, uh, the Red Wolf Coalition, and uh, Wildland Network. All of these nonprofits are working together to try and uh, educate the, the, the local public and about what the red wolf is and what it's doing out on the landscape and what it isn't doing. Their concerns can be addressed in a lot of different ways. One of the projects we're working on and helping to fund is to, they've been putting out camera traps on refuges and adjacent lands to capture pictures of all the wildlife that are coming by in, in areas like certain roads and intersections. And they're demonstrating through this photo capture work and they're gonna develop a video for outreach for that. It shows that hey, where there are red wolves, there's still plenty of wildlife, including deer and turkeys and other things that people like to hunt and are concerned that red wolves are, are chasing them all away or consuming them. So wherever the red wolf is, and there aren't that many of them out there, you still have an abundance of wildlife. And, and so we're, that's one of, one of the many ways we're trying to reach out to the public to try and get them to understand better that having a red wolf in their landscape isn't a bad thing. Because, you know, with, a, with, with the word wolf comes a whole lot of baggage. <laughs> so a lot of people get greatly concerned about it. And, it's, it's, and it is, it's the one thing that is the most challenging and most difficult to deal with. The biologists figured out how, how to recover the red wolf on the landscape. And it was the first attempt at doing it with any canid and they were successful. They grew the population from zero to nearly 150 by uh, about 2008 to 2010. They're down to about eight now. And that's because there's just a lot of changes that occurred in the Fish and Wildlife Service around the policy that was used successfully to grow it. It, it backed the biologists off of doing certain things that were successful and it's caused the population to decline. And we as a refuge association have challenged the Fish and Wildlife Service to do better. And we've worked with those that do challenge the service. Uh, entities like the Southern Environmental Law Center and Defenders of Wildlife are all challenging the Fish and Wildlife Service to step back up to try and recover that species because the tools are known on how to do it. They've just stopped employing them. Hey Mike, we got a question from, I may not say, if I say this name wrong, I apologize. Dr. Mercedes Caseda Embid. And she's asking a question, could you share some of your most effective strategies for advocating for wildlife and ensuring ecological integrity as uphold these refuge landscapes? Can you, Mike, can you address the ecological integrity question? Yeah, I think at, uh, at Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, when the whole issue of, uh, uh, speaking about climate change, and some people are squeamish about that and just don't, they, 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 it's too hard to say they can see it happening, but here on the coast, where elevations where people live and work are so close to the sea level, they're seeing things change because the sea level is rising slowly but surely. And so at Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, working with the Nature Conservancy and the Department of Defense, because they have 46,000 acres that are vulnerable to this inundation from sea level rise, we've, we've gotten the word out by putting, by saying there's things you can do. Certain kinds of wet water control structures can be put in. Uh, rock sills just offshore that act like reefs but all, and benefit uh, the fisheries, but they also dampen wave action on the shoreline. So you, you have a slowing of the rate of erosion on the shoreline. And looking at what vegetation is both beneficial to wildlife and holds soil in the face of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion and, and trying to determine 
can you restore those kind of vegetative communities so that you're holding on to your soil and providing good habitat for wildlife, living shoreline kind of work. Now, on a very large landscape level scale, we're talking miles and miles of shoreline around a place like Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, because it and the bottom range can sit, make up over 200,000 acres of land and a very long shoreline with the, with the Pamlico Sound. So there's, there's various approaches where we're trying to say, you can maintain the ecological integrity of a place in the face of change, because change is, is part of the system, it always has been. It's just the rate of change that is the concern. So if you can affect the rate through water management capability and some other uh, activities, then, then you can maintain that integrity and you don't lose uh, plant communities. And if you lose the plant community, you know you lose the wildlife. Okay, other questions? Anybody else got a hand up? There is a question about, is there a website to learn more specifics about each, each refuge, see maps, et cetera? So we gave you our information for our website, which is not the perfect one for doing that, but we're really hoping you do come to our website to see the, the work we're involved in, not in just North Carolina, but across the country for refuges. But the Fish and Wildlife Service will have websites that would list all the different refuges in the country. I'm not quite sure what that would be, but I think if you went to, to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service site and plug in refuges, I think you would get led to the right place. Right. If you if you if you say if you ask if you go do the Google search or search whatever engine you use and just type in North if you're interested in North Carolina refuges, you type in North Carolina refuges and you'll see a, a list of links. Look for the links that that uh, either end in fws.org or it, 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 you, and then the name of the refuge right before that. And that will take you to a, re, a website specific to that refuge and give you good basic information, including links to brochures, maps, and, uh, and, and ways to contact the local management to get more questions answered. I dropped a link into the uh, chat. Um, it's actually a place where you can type in your zip code and then find a refuge closest oh, great. to you. Yeah, thank you, Eden. Yeah. What other questions we have out there? I see a new one from Joe. Um, it says, in the Instagram age, some natural sites or locations can be over visited for the purpose of getting that perfect photo. Um, do you ever deal with the sites that are over-visited? Um, if so, what sorts of National Wildlife Refuge sites get too much attention? And how do you or the refuges handle it? Well, I, I have a, a, some examples. One, because there are so many black bear at a place like Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, it's only 15 miles from the Outer Banks where millions of people come to visit. If they hear about it, they'll, they'll go out there and start driving around. And that's not really the issue. It's where they see a bear and they stop and then somebody else stops and then somebody gets out and somebody starts walking toward them. And photographers, if they don't have a telephoto lens, will start walking closer and closer to them. And, and then the response, the management response is to, you know, you, you end up putting law enforcement out there just to, to inform people this is dangerous, put signage out to say, you know, because you find food, people start putting food up because they want to attract them. And then you remind them that a fed bear is a dead bear because if you habituate a bear to get real close to people, the agency, not just us, but the, the state wildlife resource commission feels compelled to try and deal with it as a nuisance then, a nuisance created by, by people's you know, over keen interest to get closer and closer. And then the bear would has to be removed. And you can, you can dart a bear and drug it and truck it 25, 30 miles away. But that's a, that's a half a day's walk for a bear. <laughs> They'll come right back to where they were if that's where the food was. Not just the food people were feeding them, but that, you know, if, they're, if they're in a certain location in concentrations because of the management of the refuge, like farm fields. At Alligator River, there's 2,500 acres of farm fields that private land farmers farm under an agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service, they don't pay rent, but they have to leave more about 25% of their crop on the ground. 
they can't plant crops that aren't good for wildlife. So there's no cotton, but plenty of corn and soybeans and small grains and things like that. And those things are attracted to bear and they come out and feed on them. So it's, you know, it's a, places like Peon can have a lot of visitation, but it's, it's a, there have signage around bird nesting areas and turtle nesting areas are the first, the first tool. And, and then if you have people in the summer, college interns, giving programs to people that come to the visitor center to let them know, you know, the best way to, to observe but not harm or harass wildlife in a certain location, the ones they want to look at. And, and answer the questions, why can't I go in there? Well, that's, it, it's too disturbing for that species and it's trying to nest and where it has young. And so, you know, you, you just have to have people and that's the most expensive thing to have. That, that's why, as, as Jeff alluded to, at, for example, the, the nine refuges in the coastal plain in North Carolina, there's one friends group, it's called the Coastal Wildlife Refuge Society, and they serve all nine of those refuges. And they serve them by helping uh, fundraise to get money to do certain projects like improve trails, signage, uh, and also to hire during the summer college interns that the refuge houses, and then they're trained to do programs or help do biological work or maintenance work. And they become the capacity and capability to actually get the word out to the public about, you saw the one picture I had of somebody taking a, taking a group on a canoe tour. And these, these are canoe tours that people pay a modest fee for, but they get out and they hear about the place and they interact with a, a thoughtful, energetic young college person. And uh, it's a good experience for all. The student gets experience and the public gets a great uh, uh, high quality visitor experience. Hey, so we're nearing the end of our time. I'm going to take two final ones that I can answer pretty easily, I think, and then we'll wrap it up with, with John Weir here and, and say our goodbyes to you all. So um, one question is uh, from Kellen Hours. He says, I'm a senior in high school and very interested in going to wildlife and conservation management. How can I get involved in conservation as young as I am? We actually bring on a fair amount of interns um, with the Refuge Association. And we, um, we have, for instance, from Duke University, uh, Stanbeck internship that we bring in a couple every year. And just, you know, it's a great program for us. We also um, have an intern we brought on just recently from, you know, someone that we met by accident, their daughter had graduated from Roanoke College, and she's working for us right now, working on some of our, um, well, I'm not going to go into what the projects are, but she's an intern working for us. And we're working with, with John, Dr. Weir right now on some interns for refuges in North Carolina. We're working on trying to get that set up. So I understand you're in high school and that may not be the exact right thing for you, but I'd be very glad to, to talk to you. So my email is ghaskett, G-H-A-S-K-E-T-T -T, at refugeassociation.org. If you just want to email me and give me a phone number, I'll call you. We can talk a little bit about, um, you know, some ways that you know, you can get into the wildlife field. And then the final question I was going to take, and Jesus, it kind of disappeared already on me, but someone asked, oh, uh, Rick Rohde asked the question, who should we contact to increase your funding? I love that question because it's actually two questions. One is for us, remember, we're a small nonprofit. There's only 17 of us, you know, cover the entire country and, and like six or seven of them are part-time workers. So we, we, we get by on supporters, you know, so if you go to our website, there's a link. We always got to mention this, that if you want to donate to our work, we'd be very happy to, to take your support and appreciate it very much. The other part of that question though, I think is, you know, how do we contact the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of the Interior and the people who are making decisions about the budget there, right? So it really needs to be a billion dollars to catch up with inflation. Again, I think go to our website that Eden has put on there. We have action alerts. We're trying to educate people all the time. We ask for help trying to do that kind of thing or contact us. And we'd be glad to talk to you about specifics on ways that, you know, that you can help try and raise the, the level of recognition of the refuge system and, and their ability to get better budgets. So again, we're just kind of out of time, but you, you have our, our information for contacting us. I give you my email, you know, please come to our website. 
I, I do want to, I don't know, John, if you want to say some final words or not, but I do want to mention again that we are developing just this wonderful, awesome, great relationship with John and the folks at Catawba College. And we really appreciate uh, working with them. And the fact that, you know, uh, Dr. Weir offered us up to be able to do this a couple months ago. And I think this is super cool that we can talk to a community, you know, get the word out to you and have some conversations like this. And so we really, really do cherish and, and value our relationship we're building with the college and, and John and his folks. And we're going to be doing a follow-up sometime in the next couple of weeks uh, session, kind of like this for faculty and students at the college as well. So that will be coming too. So John, thank you. I don't know if you have any final words you want to give to people before we finish up. Yes, uh, really, really look forward to working with you. Uh, I do want to mention that we have a number, number of faculty that, that, are be, that are excited and have worked and will continue to work with you. Uh, Dr. Jay Boland with the Department of Biology, who's the chair there, and uh, Dr. Sue Cautaney, who heads up our internships for the Department of Environment Sustainability, and Dr. Luke Dollar, who is chair of the Department of Environment Sustainability. So we've got a number of folks that uh, are very excited and working hard to make this work. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for being here. I'm, uh, it's 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 always nice to meet together, but uh, this is a, another choice, and uh, we really appreciate everybody's time tonight. So thank you all for all those great questions, a uh, wonderful evening, and thank you again, um, Jeff and Mike and uh, uh, Eden. We really appreciate all the work you put in, and we'll look forward to seeing everyone soon. Yeah, this is great. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, so everyone, for spending the time with us tonight. And we hope you all enjoyed as much as we did. This is just a kind of a fun thing to do for us. So I think we're signing off. Everyone yeah. stay hate, stay safe and healthy. And, you know, the world needs to keep getting better. And hopefully it will. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.